Hey everybody, it's time for more Alienated. We are up to chapter 40 already. I hope you're enjoying the story so far. If you are, make sure you've hit subscribe. If you're stumbling on this video for the very first time and you're wondering what am I talking about and what is it about aliens and high schools and what's happening, start at the beginning. So go to the top of this playlist if you're on YouTube or you can go to my website at jeffnorton.com and everything is archived there. Now, before we crack on, a quick shout out. This is going out to Rose in Pinner. Rose, I hope you're doing well, staying in and staying safe. Making sure you're listening to everything your mom and dad have to say. Um, chapter 40, Sacrifice. We emerged above a large blue lake, nestled inside a rocky ridge. It was almost a perfect circle, and I remembered learning in planetology that circular lakes were usually meteor-made. But whatever the origin of the lake, it was still filled with water, a potentially lethal allergen to my best friend. Octo, I said, you can't go in there, it could kill you. But the venti tent was on a mission, even if it was a suicide one. Gonna have to take that risk, he said, pointing a few tentacles to the rocky hills on the horizon. A swarm of neds crested the ridge. They'd found us. I'll go, offered Juliet. Octo shook his head. Adios, dudes, he bellowed, holding the end of the warp conduit between two tentacles as he dived out. It was nice knowing ya! Octo, no! I cried. It'll... But it was too late. He'd splashed down in the water, all twenty tentacles flailing as steam rose from his flailing body. He screamed and shouted a variety of swear words, adding to my galang cursing vocabulary. But to his credit, he never once let go of the ever-expanding bracelet. And neither did the team on the racer. If he survives, Jessica announced, I am so going to be his girlfriend. I skimmed over the water, stretching open the red conduit until it covered the entire lake and hovered over the opposite shore. That should be big enough, I said. Let go. Our edge of the massive rubber ring fell from the back hatch and settled into shape, a gigantic circle resting on the lake that opened a vortex through time and space. Dad, we're in position. Top gun, Sherman. We've created the vortex on our side right over the hole the ship made. They're none the wiser, and they're lowering that giant straw straight down into it. Suddenly, the Ned world shook and rumbled. The rocky outposts overlooking the lake shuddered, cracked, and fell. The swarming Neds started to fall out of the sky. They fell into the water, doggy paddling to stay afloat, while the vortex beneath them robbed their planet of its magma. I turned Carol around and went back for Octo, hoping my friend was still alive. Instead of dodging laser flashes, I was suddenly dodging hundreds of tumbling, complaining Neds, all wearing the same bewildered, how could this happen to someone as awesome as me, expression, as I splashed in their round lake. The magma's the source of their power, I realized. The straw is draining their planet, sucking the magma into the tanker and taking their strength with it. I circled the area where Octo had jumped and stared at the water. Finally, I saw him surface. Ah-choo! It wasn't a sneeze. It was Sneezezilla. Sneeze point eight on the Richter scale. The kind of sneeze that could burst only from someone staggeringly, alarmingly allergic. The venti tent surfaced among three Neds trying to use each other's life rafts, but they instantly backed off, swimming away like they were scared of catching something contagious. Octo's rectangular eyes bulged. His blue and yellow striped skin was blackened and charred. Oh no, Jessica groaned. He's hurt bad. I lowered the racer, hovering just over the lapping water. Houston, Juliet, and Juliet, sorry, Houston, Jessica, and Juliet each grabbed a couple of tentacles and hauled Octo aboard. How is he? I yelled from the cockpit. He's alive, Sherman, said Juliet, but in bad shape. That Totally sucked, Octo wheezed in a scratchy voice. But you did it, buckaroo, I said, turning around and smiling at my flambéed friend. We'll get you your allergy cream and you'll be Ikea colors once again. Your bravery will go down in history, Houston added, tapping his photoreceptors. And I've got it all on video. It'll go viral. And I hope you venti tents heal quickly, Jessica said, checking her watch, because there's still plenty of prom left and I'm in the mood for dancing. Whew, feeling better already, Octo beamed. Sherman, called my dad through the speakerphone. Did it work? 
You did it, Dad, I replied. The conduit sent the straw through the wormhole all the way here. The earth is safe, the Neds are powerless, and we're coming home in time for the last bit of prom. I flashed the boosters and prepared, prepared to take us back to the wormhole highway. No, Sherman, you did it, Dad said, and I'm so incredibly proud of you. I don't think he'd ever used the P word with me. It felt good, really good, for about an instant. But son, he continued, and with Dad, there is always a but. You have a choice to make now, he said gravely. What choice, I asked. If you keep the wormhole open, and the Ned world will implode and die at our hands. He was right. If the straw sucked out the planet's core, the Ned world would collapse in on itself, just like they had planned for planet Earth. You, Sherman Capote, Juliet said, have the power to save their home. I'd saved our world, but endangered another. And as much as I despised Ned and his entitled, cruel, uppity planet, was I really ready to let an entire species die? Okay, that's chapter 40. Come back tomorrow for chapter 41. Make sure you've hit subscribe and keep reading. Stay in, stay safe.